Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm your moderator for this afternoon's IFOA Asia Member Town Hall. My name is Wen Li. Most of you probably know me by now already. I am the IFOA East Asia Rep based in Beijing. So it's my pleasure to have you all joining us this afternoon. I can still see the number going up. That means some of you are still joining us. Very pleased to have you all here this afternoon with us. So you will have the chance today to virtually meet over president and the CEO and to hear from them about various topics, including international strategy, especially in China and East Asia new CPD requirements and uh, IFOA's uh, uh, reaction to the COVID-19 in the recent months. So at the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session for you to ask them questions. So can I please ask you to send in your questions at any time by typing them in the Q&A box, dialog box that you can find at the bottom of your screen or your phone. But please be noted that your questions may or may not be asked depending on how many questions that we receive and how relevant they are to the presentations. If your questions don't get asked, by all means send it to me or my colleague in Singapore, Karen, she's also on the line, but you probably can't see her. So then we will try to address your questions after this session because we only have an hour. But don't be put off if your questions don't get asked. So before I pass you to the president, I would just like to introduce him and the CEO very briefly. As you already know, Mr. Tan Sui She is the IFOA's first Asian president. He became a president in June this year. He was the past president. So some of you may have met him when he was in China last December. Wei Shi graduated from London School of Economics with a first class degree honor. He later also uh, achieved master's degree in psychology from Columbia University in the US. He's worked in the UK and Southeast Asia throughout his career. He, uh, he was the CEO of Singapore Prudential. He started his career in the UK Prudential. One of his earlier career awards was the outstanding CEO of the year. He now, apart from being of a president, he's also an independent non-executive director of uh, several organizations in Singapore. So he's still very active in the uh, insurance industry. Moving to the CEO of the IFOA, um, you probably have seen the announcement in January this year. The CEO of the IFOA is Stephen Mann. He joined us in January this year. Prior to joining the IFOA, Stephen has worked extensively with the actuarial community in the UK. He was a board director of the UK Aviva, responsible for strategy, business services, and some of the major capital projects. More recently, he served as a CEO at the UK Police Mutual Board. Stephen originally qualified as a lawyer. So in his early career, he worked as a lawyer in the city. So hopefully you will find out more about both of them later on. But without further ado, I now pass you to Mr. Tan. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you can hear me well, uh, Wenli. I can hear you perfectly. I am very pleased to be uh, with all of you. Uh, uh, many of you know me well in Singapore and Malaysia, uh, less so uh, from China. Uh, about there are 350 who registered and about 200 have turned up, uh, majority from Malaysia, Singapore, and China. And as I was writing the notes for today's talk, uh, I realized that I have not met you guys 
and ladies uh, in person uh, since I became president. Yeah. So I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to partner uh, Stephen uh, in our town hall uh, because so much has changed uh, in the last 10 months. Yeah, I've not traveled uh, to UK uh, since January. I, I have um, about 15 slides, but I'm going to uh, also include some of the questions you have submitted to Wen Li and Karin about five of the questions in the answer. So it will take maybe about 20 minutes or 25 minutes. I'm try to do that. Uh, and, and, and the way uh, the team, uh, uh, Karin and Wen Li have uh, helped us uh, organize this. It's really to tell you the story. And I wanted to make it a story. Yeah. So the story is about the geography of Southeast Asia where I grew up and the geography of China. And then the story of strategy. Yeah? Uh, the strategy of what IHOA is doing. Uh, and also some specifics, uh, because I know that you are interested in specifics. I, I suppose the story must begin. The story must begin uh, some 30, 40 years ago, because uh, Karin and Mary will know I was amazed in 2017 uh, when I rejoined the profession, because I was out of the profession in 1995 when I became a CEO, less active. Uh, about the progress uh, that has been made uh, since, uh, since the year I qualified, 1984. I was the first uh, amongst uh, three of us qualified in the same year, uh, Zainal uh, and Govin, a Malay, a Chinese, and, and an Indian, three of us. And for the next 15 years, from 1984 to 2000, another three qualified. Another three. So there are only six or seven who qualified in the first 15 years, but three happened to qualify in 84. Uh, in the first 10 years of this decade, about 40 qualified in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then the next decade, 2010 to year 2020, about 100 qualified. And I was so pleased uh, to see 20 Malaysians qualifying last year. And, and 16 of them I gave certificates to. I was just astounded, 20 actuaries in one year uh, qualifying. But that is a result of the seeds planted many years ago. So I wanted to answer the question, uh, which the presenter asked uh, either Wen Li or, or, or Karin, how is IOA planning to increase its reach in Asia? And what are the key statistics showing outcomes of efforts? Clearly, IFOA can bring more discipline, ethics, and professionalism in certain parts of Asia through training more actuaries to the highest standards with us. And I think we are doing that. Of course, the best time to plant a tree is 25 years ago. But the next best time is to plant a tree today. Uh, and that is what uh, Stephen, um, Sarah Sim, uh, and I uh, resolved to do after the visit to China. Uh, China's progress, they have about 50 actuaries, is less dramatic, but nevertheless, they started late. Uh, but we agreed uh, in the last six or eight months, the emphasis on China uh, to match the very successful Southeast Asia as we march forward. And that is a very big change uh, in mindset. And in China, uh, and I believe Sarah is in the program, uh, Wen Li and Jing Chang, he was it was an eye-opening experience for me about the importance of China and Hong Kong. And of course, if you're in China, you won't be surprised, but I, I felt opportunities uh, were, were many and we should take part of it. And the first thing I did uh, when Stephen came on board, uh, not the first thing, maybe the next month, the second month, was to, tell, to persuade him uh, to come to China. But of course, COVID-19 changed all that. But because of COVID-19, we actually accelerated other things which are actually equally positive. But the important thing is that you know, China, uh, I, I must also pay tribute to people who work on it. Uh, I, I think Chris Daykin uh, was one of the past presidents who put in a lot of personal effort uh, to make uh, China uh, where it is. Yeah? Uh, so, so, a great, uh, a very important decision made in the last six months is the uh, irrefutability of uh, Greater China in our schemes of things. Southeast Asia has always been there, so I wouldn't make that. So then I go to my, my next slides, yeah? 
and 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 the, the 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 things which I want to point to is that uh, essentially we got about a thousand uh, fellows, British IFOA fellows, operating uh, in uh, in Asia, in Asia, and that, that is a dramatic change. Yeah, uh, but these are actually about three hundred and fifty in China, uh, which includes Hong Kong, and four hundred and fifty. Uh, in Southeast Asia, which include uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, and so on, and the growth is steady. But but the important thing is that we must continue uh, to plant the seeds, and that's what we do. And how are we planting the seeds? Yeah, uh, I, I think one of the dramatic consequence of COVID nineteen is the way we have to respond as individuals, as organization, as a profession. Uh, I was very impressed, and I mentioned it in my presidential address, uh, that Stephen and his team uh, responded remarkably impressively uh, by putting our uh, exam hall exams online in April, uh, and then it, and also very successfully in an open book type environment in September, and the response has been good, and that would be part of our life. In the future of moving online, as far as I'm concerned, uh, that acceleration is uh, is obvious. There are always issues of plagiarization, collusion, or false identity, but all those can be resolved digitally. We are in the right side of history. Yeah, so I'm very proud of that because it is consistent with the spirit and the strategy of VSMB. Uh, the Asian seminar, which uh, Karine and and Sean Deegan and Amanda put in a lot of effort to be a showcase in Malaysia and Singapore the week after my after my installation in London did not take place, uh, but we did well. We did well to put a seminar uh, online. But there are also lessons we can learn. We could be uh, smarter in positioning uh, in terms of uh, more imaginative with our marketing uh, and all that. But those lessons are, are good for the future. Uh, but as a result, I think some 800 um, uh, or 750 people registered. I normally would expect three to 400. Uh, but what the format will be, uh, I will not know. So then I give you a sense uh, of geography about what we have been doing uh, in this part of the world. Uh, but planting seeds, it is about making the employers who employ us value our work. Uh, it is about giving a pipeline uh, of the best and the right students, and also making sure uh, our skill sets and our mindsets make us uh, relevant, uh, effective, and impactful. And on all this, uh, we made significant advancements despite COVID-19. Uh, Stephen spent, uh, I'm not sure how many hours, uh, uh, talking to about 50 to 60 employers, uh, Great Eastern, AIA, and many of them in Asia, Munich, Ri, Chak, Ping An, uh, Tokyo Marine, uh, Mountain uh, Creek, uh, actual partners in Asia, because he wants to understand, uh, the first thing he did, wanted to do, he wanted to understand how we are seen in the place of our work and how we can make ourselves more valuable. That surely must be uh, very important to all of us. And I know uh, both Karin and, and uh, Wenli, uh, uh, along with Clifford, uh, work very hard to establish uh, the pipeline of students we need. Uh, and, and in the last 12 months, we have signed up uh, Fudan, I was there, uh, and also um, uh, Fudan and also Mahindol in, in, uh, in Bangkok. Uh, and, and one other name uh, from China, I, I can't remember, but uh, 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 which we signed up in the last uh, um, 12 months. Yeah. So, so with that, uh, just have a look at my time uh, to see how am I doing for time. I'm doing quite well. Okay. So, so I, I, I don't really want to repeat uh, what I've said in the presidential address. Yeah. But I do want to give you something specific because I know that uh, many of my Singaporean and Malaysian friends, uh, you are interested that I, we don't want more talk, we want something specific. 
uh, we agreed uh, that we will have um, a banking fellowship, uh, fellowship in banking in 2022. Yeah. We agreed that we will have a certificate uh, in climate science, climate change, as we have a certificate in data science, uh, which is now rolling in a second cohort and going to a third cohort, very well received. We also agreed uh, on a program called uh, Project Moonshot, yeah? I'm going to, uh, about how we are going to introduce increasingly new content within our existing syllabus and bring VSMD alive. But today is not the day uh, for us to go into that because it is uh, a whole set of uh, presentations. But I wanted uh, to tell you about, um, about a specific, yeah. Uh, and we are very excited uh, uh, by the progress we have made. Uh, and there's a lot of work to be done, yeah. Uh, next, I come to a more, um, a, a more important point about VSMD, yeah, about VND, and that plays into, uh, plays into the space uh, of the repositioning and the reinventing of the profession. And in that process, I'm going to answer four questions uh, which have been put to uh, Wenli and Karin concerning the challenge of technology and the importance of judgment about how do we use AI and machine learning and about uh, my view about insurance technology in China and lastly about how actuaries contribute uh, to, uh, to uh, climate science yeah, and climate change. I think the most important thing uh, for us to realize that is our DNA that we are people who enjoy mathematics and are good in mathematics. Because if you don't have that, I think it's hard to be in this space. But we want to work in practical settings, in organizations uh, where our skills can add value. And by definition, we want to be relevant, we want to be influential and impactful. None of us, and certainly I've not met anyone unless their father happened to be working in an insurance company, who says their ambition at the age of 17 is to work in an insurance company or pension scheme. I've thought many one at the age of 17 and 18, because it's not the most glamorous places to work. But we do work there eventually because the value which actually creates are higher so that they are protected, registered. But we all decided to be an actuary because of our love of mathematics and we want to be a practical setting and by, and we want to have rewarding careers. Yeah? So if you think about it in these terms, we want to be relevant, influential, and impactful, definitely in our workplace, whether it's in an insurance company, in a pension fund, in investments, in fintech, uh, in uh, health ecosystems, or in a consultancy, or in a regulatory board. Uh, we want to be good in our work. And to be good in our work is actually applying the skills we have, but the skills we have are now being undermined or replaced by data science, machine learning, learning and AI. And therefore, we got to freshen our mathematical core by extending into data science, machine learning and AI. And that is a non-negotiable. Now that is what I call the primary axis. But we also realize that for us to be effective in acquiring skill sets and become value adding in a digital world, you got to have new mindsets. Yeah? Because our old mindsets or the quintessential mindsets is about accuracy, cautiousness, reticence, um, and consistency are very important as we do our mathematics and do our financial condition report and our pricing. And that is still going to be important. But the skills and mindsets required for us to thrive in the digital revolution and the fourth industrial revolution, as well as in the world of uncertainty and new domains like the pandemic and the COVID-19 uh, and uh, climate shocks requires us uh, to have imagination, uh, courage, judgment, and adaptability and a learning mindset. That's why the skill sets are not enough. It's not about giving skills to this generation. It's about giving the right mindsets to the people who, who help them to change their mindset and incorporate new mindsets in the whole profession. 
Only then we can thrive in our workplace. The second place is that do our work stop at our workplace? And then we go into the purpose of the profession. The purpose of the profession could be about having wonderful careers, but we do have a public interest in our Royal Charter. Public interest means that as a profession, we care more than just for ourselves. And what is our public interest? Our public interest is actually to make sure that things we add value to operate along sound financial lines. And above all, we are risk professionals. So if you are risk professionals, by definition, our modeling, our advice has to rest on systems which are sustainable. And, and, and in the last five years, uh, climate risk, income inequality has undergone tremendous shocks and pandemic uh, COVID-19 have unmasked it. And it creates us a great opportunity for us to claim the space. Uh, actuaries are individuals who make a difference in the industry. Uh, in other words, it is not just about our risk models. It is about incorporating uh, climate risk into our thinking. It is not just about um, uh, doing our work well because the regulators say that we must price it in a certain way. Although the pricing it does or the products we design which pass all the regulatory tests has very unintended consequences for our customers. So at one hand, we got to be accurate and cautious and doing our work. On the other hand, our public interests require us, require us uh, to help create more sustainable systems because otherwise we become ineffective risk professionals. So on that two front, we have to modernize our skill set mindsets so that we are better in the workplace. But on the other hand, uh, on the second hand is to get uh, uh, our mindsets and skill sets so that we can be impactful uh, in the industry and the society we work in. Technology, uh, it, it, so in many ways, the application on the specifics, whether it's climate science, uh, on AI, uh, or, or insurance technology, uh, you really need to have an innovative mindset. And that has to come with curiosity and imagination. It is not something which comes with mathematics on its own. It's about curiosity and it's about joining the dots. Uh, and we had great conversations with a panel of experts, uh, Moonshot uh, Committee, uh, involving educators and university professors about this. And our new syllabus will be anchored on that. So I mentioned about uh, quintessential values, uh, which I think um, uh, Frank Reddington uh, was very skillful in grouping this together because it's display our emphasis on that. And, and and we do not have to be like this. We need to have greater diversity of values, yeah, which I've made my case uh, in the in the uh, in the uh, actual uh, in the presidential address. I, I'm I'm drawing to a close now, uh, but I want to tell you uh, that it is not about strategy. Uh, strategy is very important. It tells us where we go, but it's also about ourselves, our culture. Culture, as in culture of the profession, there's you and me in our workplace, uh, in Prudential, in uh, CXA, in EXA, uh, but also the culture of IFOA. Yeah. So I, I, I want to uh, give, show you the next slide, uh, which, I, which I thought about this morning. Uh, we can tell you uh, many things about the strategy and the, VSMD is a big component, so it's serving our members well, as well as the international strategy, which great great emphasis to, to China, Southeast Asia, and India, uh, and, and also uh, other parts of the world. But, but a lot of it will depend on how we execute as a team. Yeah, And that team, uh, on, on a full-time basis, is uh, led by Stephen, plus the volunteers, like me, like Luis, John, and the senior volunteers, how we do work together to deliver the proposition uh, uh, for the membership. And many of the issues I raised in the presidential address has to do with our governance. Yeah? Uh, because I feel that IVOA can be more responsive, uh, can be more member-centric, uh, 
uh, in all our de uh, deliberations. And the more I reflected on it, uh, it actually arises out of the culture of the profession, yeah? uh, that is us. Uh, because we wanted things to be consistent, we want things to be uh, cautious, we want things to be accurate. So we design very elaborate governance and systems to make sure uh, that's that. And that has been, that has served us well. Uh, but the world is no longer the stable world we live in. Digital uh, and the fourth industrial revolution requires to have changed mindsets. But COVID-19 and the shock of COVID-19 propel us to do online exams within six weeks. Uh, six weeks or four weeks or eight weeks, it doesn't matter. It was record time, which we couldn't have agreed in our old governance system. There is a, a collective will uh, in a leadership team that we are not going to go back to the old ways, but to go forward. And that requires us to be clear of what this profession is about, uh, the quintessential values, but creating diversity and space for the new values. And that will make our governance lighter. And, and that will allow Stephen and his uh, team uh, to do things differently uh, in service of our profession. And I know that he's, the team is embarking uh, on a very important journey, uh, which all of us are part of, uh, a journey of cultural transformation. And that is not, uh, not a trivial point. Uh, it's a very significant point. So I'm terribly excited uh, about, about where we are. Uh, and also rather pleased that I could do this in 23 uh, minutes as I close my session. So I'm uh, very happy to talk to you. Uh, I'm going to pass to Stephen. I'm going to stop sharing. And if, if there are questions unanswered, uh, you, can you can ask later on. So, so with that, um, uh, I, I pass to uh, Stephen. Uh, thank you, uh, Sweet Che. And, and firstly, uh, may I say how delighted I am to be able to speak to you uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm also delighted to be sharing the platform uh, with uh, Sweet Che. Uh, if you um, uh, look at the key essence of the slides that he shared with you, uh, he talks very passionately about the need to transform the actuarial profession. And that was one of the reasons I joined IFOA uh, to play my part in trying to uh, move that forward. So what I've got, I've got uh, just a handful of slides that I want to talk to. Uh, some early reflections uh, from uh, just my, my first 10 months uh, at IFOA. Um, uh, and uh, then um, uh, with a, a few elements that we're focusing on at the moment, that hopefully will give you an indication uh, that we're making uh, good progress against uh, uh, the targets that we've set ourselves. So, um, uh, Kate, if you could just flick us on to the, uh, the next slide, uh, please. So uh, I joined IFOA uh, in January, uh, as Sweet Che had said. Um, uh, I had planned to be able to see some of you uh, in April. I had a, quite an extensive China and Southeast Asian tour scheduled. Um, uh, sadly, that's not been possible. I hope it won't be too long before I get to see uh, many of you. Um, but part of my uh, induction, and one thing I was really keen to uh, understand was what our actuaries are saying to us, uh, and in particular, and as Sweet Che referred earlier, uh, what a lot of the key employers uh, who employ many of our members are saying about IFOA and the future of the profession. Uh, and I think that was very illuminating uh, in the sense that, particularly uh, in Southeast Asia and China, recognition that uh, although uh, there are many different business models, there are many different market pressures, markets are often at different stages of the development, the role and importance of actuaries is unchanged. Uh, but a recognition that the world around us uh, and the world for these businesses is changing very, very rapidly. Uh, a huge appreciation and a recognition that IFOA actuaries uh, are very special. Uh, their ability to apply knowledge is quite unique. But a recognition that with a world that seems to be changing very rapidly, uh, the importance of having the right mindset, the right skill set to stay ahead of the curve remains really, really uh, important. And that's led me to work with the presidential team to uh, ask a sort of quite a basic question, which is so, what is the purpose of the IFOA uh, in helping support these changes? Well, evidently, uh, we are um, uh, uh, a member-led organization. 
and we need to listen to the voice of our members. But ultimately, I think to achieve what it is that we want to achieve, we must also aspire to become the voice of the profession. Uh, and underpinning that uh, is the transformation of IFOA itself. And I'll touch on some of the early things that we're doing uh, in a moment. Uh, but probably the theme that overarches this is the need to support the lifelong learning of our members to make sure that their skills remain current, uh, that they um, uh, uh, are sought after and that our members have careers that are uh, rewarding and fulfilling personally, but also enable us as a community to contribute to some of the uh, biggest challenges that the world uh, is facing. And lifelong learning uh, and our support for that is a key element of that. Okay, if you could just move us on to the uh, next slide, please. So I just want to start with, with CPD. This was sort of uh, one of the first elements that we've managed to introduce, I think a reflection um, that um, uh, if we are going to support an actual community that have a current set of skills, we need to be able to support actuaries learning year on year. And I think probably a recognition that for many of our members, CPD, continuing professional development, has been perhaps a tick box exercise where we focus more on what people have done rather than what people have learned. So uh, what we are seeking to do and seek to do with this uh, uh, approach is to focus on the outcomes that people uh, have achieved over the course of the year and to do it in a way which is perhaps a bit more flexible, a recognition that uh, perhaps the old ways of learning, attending courses, watching webinars, etc., uh, isn't necessarily the best and most immersive way of learning uh, moving forward. What we have done as well is introduce um, the concept of reflective learning. And I think that's really important. Um, from my time uh, in, in business, um, I've developed a very clear view uh, that the two reasons that businesses fail is because leaders tend to have excessive certainty in their own beliefs uh, or that they fail to appreciate what they don't know. Uh, and I think when we look at learning, uh, the concept of reflective learning is just to enable us to, to seek a pause where people can, uh, can take a step back uh, and uh, just reflect a little bit on uh, how I work, uh, what are my underlying assumptions and beliefs, and just have a sense check to say, are they the right ones moving forward? And perhaps should I be a little bit more open-minded about where things go? And obviously, in the nature of the relationship we have with a number of uh, our key employers uh, in Southeast Asia uh, and China, we are able to uh, link this uh, with our quality assurance scheme. But hopefully you can get a sense that this is IFOA moving a bit with the times and developing um, a CPD arrangements that are more flexible, more modern and more progressive and more suited, I think, to making sure that our membership uh, uh, retains current skills. If we could look at the next slide, please. Um, you know, I touched earlier on uh, ISOA being a member-led organization. That's because uh, you, as our members, have a key role to play in making sure that the leadership uh, takes uh, things forward. Uh, and I think there are many good things about ISOA. We have a hugely uh, respected brand, a hugely respected presence. Um, uh, and when I speak to my colleagues in ISOA, uh, we hugely care about what our members say about us. That is probably a little bit different from having a what I'll call a fully member-centric culture. And I know we've got more work to do uh, in that front. And uh, underpinning that is the need to provide a good member service. Um, and I think there is more that we can do, particularly to support our membership base outside the UK. Uh, we have work in train to help deliver that. We have investments in systems and operations to try and do more. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll see more deliveries as we come through. Ultimately, uh, if we create a vibrant community of IFOA colleagues, volunteers and our membership, I think we'll be unstoppable. And when I see that work well, I think it is absolutely fantastic. I think there is more that we can do to create a stronger sense of global community uh, for our membership uh, as well there. But as I said earlier, I think we have uh, work to do. I think we have some understanding of what our members really value. But one of the reasons I went out to speak to a number of our key employers was to get their perspective. And we will be reaching out. There's a membership survey uh, to be launched over the next day or two. And I'd really encourage you to uh, tell us what you really value. Uh, there's a real danger that uh, 
uh, we try and second guess what it is that you really value. And what we'd like to do is hear that from you directly and for that to underpin absolutely everything that we do to try and support you as we take things forward. And what I want to try and achieve is a sort of sense where IFOA's uh, reputation as having heritage remains, but it is a heritage that is forward looking and seen to be progressive and where you feel supported uh, in having uh, careers that are fulfilling and that where you are able to, to achieve your potential. Uh, so keep giving us the feedback, we will take it on board um, and so on. Uh, Kate, if you could just move us on to the next slide. Um, so as we said earlier, said earlier um, we have had to respond uh, nimbly to the pandemic. Um, the most practical impact was that I didn't get to travel to China and Southeast Asia, uh, but we had to work very quickly to get our exams uh, online. They were all scheduled in uh, the middle of March to be uh, taken in nearly 150 exam centres uh, across the world. Uh, and just five weeks later, we were able to deliver the majority of them uh, online. Uh, a question has come in as to whether or not uh, we think this is likely to be the path moving forward. Uh, we've, we've yet to take a formal decision, but personally, I think it seems really unlikely uh, that we would move back to the exam centre approach. Uh, his, uh, Sri Chay talked about uh, which way the wind is blowing from, from a history perspective. Uh, we've been really happy with the quality that we've been able to, to, to see with the exams. Um, uh, the student experience, we had uh, record positive feedback uh, from April uh, and the early feedback from the September exams is that they have uh, seemed to have landed very well uh, with students. Uh, we have also had to pivot uh, quite sharply to get a number of our events uh, online, given that it's no longer possible uh, in most locations to run face-to-face -face events. Uh, those have gone well. And again, I think for uh, our membership base outside the UK, Hopefully, it gives you a wider access and makes you feel part of a wider community, being able to see uh, more of those. Um, we are all working remotely. Um, uh, our colleagues in, in Beijing uh, were the first to do so uh, back in January in the UK. Uh, our offices have been shut since the middle of March. As a whole, I think we've responded really well to that. Uh, we are keeping an eye uh, on our colleagues' well-being. Uh, and support. Um, it is a, a difficult time and I know from speaking to many of the key employers uh, in your areas that uh, many of the same challenges that we're facing are the ones that they're facing too uh, and I think this really reinforces the importance of feeling part of the community as we move forward. But in a strange way um, uh, we uh, are using this opportunity to accelerate the strategy for IFOA. It's forcing us to look at the offer uh, the services that we supply our members and to look at doing them in very different ways. It's forcing us to uh, accelerate the investments we want to make uh, in our operational systems and processes. Uh, and this is a really exciting to journey to go on because as part of that, as we said earlier, is the focus on lifelong learning. Uh, we uh, began a major piece of work over the summer supported by educationalists to look at our curriculum and to look at the way we support our members at whatever stage uh, to help them achieve their potential. And I think probably we've been looking at it the wrong way around. I think becoming qualified as an ISO actuary has almost been the destination of choice. And I think in the world which is changing very rapidly, what we want to do is to make sure that membership, uh, they have skills that remain current and that people are staying ahead of the curve. Uh, so that program uh, that uh, was completed over the summer and we're now busy implementing it. Uh, some of that will enable us to introduce more dynamic elements into our curriculum. Uh, and over the last 12 months, we've already begun to introduce elements of data science, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. We would hope to have more modularity and optionality in our curriculum moving forward. And that will enable us to be more flexible uh, and flex to the demands that uh, are important to our membership moving on. So I touched a little bit on some of the early things that we've done. Uh, we have an ambitious plan uh, in train and uh, Sweet Chair and the leadership team have huge ambitions for IFOA moving forward. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to playing a part in helping those get delivered uh, over the uh, next two to three years. Uh, and uh, above all, it's really important that uh, um, uh, the growth that we're seeing in China and Southeast Asia is supported and supported on the ground. So I think our last slide is a picture of our lovely uh, Southeast Asian and China's team. 
uh, who are here to support you. Uh, as always, and as Suite said, that we are here uh, to support you too. And please don't be shy if there are questions that you want to ask us directly, either here uh, or separately. We uh, 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 would always be happy to try and answer them. So, Suite, I think that's my bit done. Uh, I think we're probably now able to open for questions and answers. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, Suite. Um, thanks for sending the questions in. Um, I've got about 20 also questions here, including those who sent in your questions before the session. So as I explained earlier, um, we probably won't have the time to, to address all the questions here this afternoon, but don't be put off if your questions not asked here, please let me and Corinne know and we will try to answer your questions after the session. So I'm just gonna pick uh, uh, those questions which are relevant to today's presentations at random. So this one particular question, which I really like, uh, influence in Asia. Um, one of the members here asked, how is the AFOA uh, planning to increase its reach in Asia? And what are the key statistics showing outcomes of efforts in the region? Clearly the AFOA can bring more discipline, ethics and professionalism to certain parts of Asia through training more actors to the highest standards it does. So I think that's a very uh, a good question and which is why um, I've asked it first. So over to you. Uh, when, uh, okay, I, uh, who, who wants to do that? Uh, Stephen, you want to do that? Uh, yeah, I, I can pick that up and uh, um, uh, that is a very good question. It, it's actually um, uh, quite a hard question to, to try and uh, answer. I think uh, in, in recent years, we've developed uh, um, uh, more support on the ground uh, for China and Southeast Asia. Um, but, but actually, I think I should probably just take a step back and say, so what is our strategy? Uh, we have um, um, a market development board that has been looking uh, at um, um, the role uh, that ISOA should play in supporting our members worldwide. And we do see Southeast Asia and China as areas where our membership is growing. And you'd have seen that from the statistics that Sui Che shared. And we uh, then have some questions now in terms of how can we support that and see that developed. So a couple of things to call out. One will be um, further uh, on the ground support. Uh, which uh, we've, we've touched on. Uh, we recognize that we've made good progress with universities, but I think there is much more that we can be doing. Uh, and I think the uh, road shows that I've been holding with employers um, have been really important uh, in giving us some insights. And the question talks about different standards, different roles, different aspirations and different recruitments. Uh, and I do think the relationships that we want to establish with key employers uh, in this region will be absolutely essential in taking that forward. I think those have been areas where we've not had established relationships. Uh, virtually every organization we've spoken to has said that they would welcome uh, a stronger set of engagement with IFOA. And I think working together uh, through a combination of those relationships with employers, universities, and stronger support on the ground, I think will help us support our growth ambitions uh, in China and Southeast Asia. Sui Che, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Yes, I, I would, uh, and I would like to do it. Uh, take a different flavor to the to the question, yeah. Because the uh, and of course I agree with everything uh, Stephen said. Uh, there are many things to do, uh, and and that's why we showed the numbers for the last five years. And I said over the last thirty years, I was impressed with Southeast Asia, yeah? but I was less impressed with China, to be honest, uh, because I got the ratios of seven to one with SOA. Not that we are competitive, but we are sort of collaboratively competitive, uh, which is, I think, fine. Uh, but I, I think that we could up our game. Uh, I know that Wenli is Italy agreeing with me, so we've got to do that. But the question has a different feel to it. Yeah? So there's a numbers thing which you need to do. But the other point is about reputation, right? Uh, discipline, ethics, and professionalism. I'm not sure I want to talk too much about discipline, but I want to talk about our reputation and professionalism. I think all of us are quite proud. Uh, I know Stephen is here and Sarah, but we're quite proud to be fellows of the IFOA. It does have a powerful brand, uh, even in China, even in China. Uh, the people who qualify do criticize about difficulty, but once they qualify, they say that ours is better than the others. Yeah? 
which I sort of agree, but let's just not get into that uh, too much. The, pop, the issue is that we, we are in Asia and we were attracted to the brand. And that brand is born out of the past. It's governance, it's intellectual leadership, it's professionalism of doing things properly. That's why it has a brand. And we've got to preserve that. But there's something else which we need to do very imaginatively. That brand has also some downside in terms of adapting to the new world, being too cautious in certain roles. And that is the subtle part. We need actuaries who are very good in the reserve roles doing what they do. But we also need actuaries who can thrive in a digital world and who can bring us along uh, into the imaginative roles into health ecosystem to solve problems of our time, which is not uh, in our traditional roles. And, and that will really unleash our reputation. So we rest on a base which is sound, solid, but we must have a capability to reinvent ourselves. And, and it's not coming from me, it's coming from Reddington, uh, it's coming from uh, uh, Dakin, Chris Dakin, uh, coming from Peter Clark, uh, the late Peter Clark from Jerry Gilford. We, we had, there is a part of us which can let, get, let it grow. And I think that part is actually quite strong in Asia. So, so how can we do together and transform the brand of, of IFOA? And that is uh, very powerful. And we are going to be good in our work, but also good in some of the social impact issues of our time. Yeah? And I think this is a really exciting part uh, for us. Uh, and, and our numbers will, will follow. I don't think we do try to go and increase numbers per se. We do all the right things. And I think the numbers will follow. Uh, but we've got to plant the seeds. Yeah? And it's never too late to plant the seeds. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I've got another very interesting question here, which is close to my heart as well. So I'm going to pick this question and ask, how can actuaries contribute towards solving the challenge of climate change? I don't know who wants to answer this first. I could have a go at that. Uh, because uh, there is about technical roles, and the other one is about advocacy. And Luis, who is uh, who is a member of the presidential team, is uh, has been advocating uh, uh, climate risk as a key risk factor, as important as interest rate, as mortality, and the council has, has embraced it. And I would say that if she presented that report three years ago, there will be more resistance to it because the zeitgeist has changed, the mood has changed. Bank of England, uh, as well as uh, the financial regulators are calling out that we should identify. In fact, MAS yesterday called out climate risk is an explicit factor. So, in our technical work, uh, it's, going, it's, uh, it's going to be important. But that has been said by the more progressive actuaries for the last three, of, three to five years the measurement of the killing index and all that. So, there's a ten but on the wider front, uh, there are many initiatives going on in terms of carbonization, in terms of um, uh, investment, uh, asset allocation, uh, in terms of risk models. Uh, so we are all at the intersection. The, the key issue is that are we going to be a rule taker? Uh, the pensions regulators say you must do it, therefore you do it. Or are we going to be thought leaders saying that we should be caring about it? I think there is a bit of a shift that we should be putting our front foot forward to make sure that the paradigm we are resting on where our risk models rest on. It's no point having our perfect risk models uh, which calculate everything correctly, but, but we do not know is uh, the real distribution of risk which is outside our models. Our models are very neoclassical, and so there is a debate uh, raging on how do we navigate it. And I can't pretend, I can't pretend that we have the answers, you know, because it's very complex. It's a very uh, systems problem. Uh, but the, the issue is that whether we have a role in contributing to the debate as risk professionals. Yeah. If you think of ourselves as mortality specialists, even today, if you think of ourselves as mortality specialists, pandemics will come and disturb you. You, know? <laughs> you are not going to stay linear in your work because everything changes with a pandemic coming in. Suddenly, they've got so many variables you know, uh, to worry about and they don't have the data, but you will come out. Our techniques are still good. But there's something else uh, which is an old, uh, an old attribute uh, 
uh, of the profession, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, I, I see many established actuaries in, in this audience and their views will differ. We used to be able to exercise judgment, judgment. Uh, but now we tend to, uh, okay, I, I got to choose my word carefully. We, we look at a model and the model could be 800 page. <laughs> if you sit on a risk committee, which some of you do, uh, I, I did, you know, 800 page risk report, you know, but, but, uh, but the pandemic was never mentioned there. Uh, just that a Northern Rock, when it failed, uh, it was rated as triple A two weeks before it failed because they never quite measure liquidity risk. Right? So, so you can see, so we can look very narrowly down, downwards to make sure what we're doing is correctly. The new strategy say that we do that, but we also look at upwards, what is happening to the systems. Yeah? Because the problem we have is not that we are not systematic. The problem we have is that the, the issue is a system. So we need to think systemically, not just systematically. We often think systematically, but we don't think systemically, which is about how relevant the system is. Because our skill sets is about working within a certain orthodoxy. But if that orthodoxy doesn't work, you really need courage, imagination, and curiosity to change the orthodoxy. Yeah? So our mindsets are very important. If we bring the old traditional mindsets, we will try to make the existing systems better, bigger, more pervasive, and more efficient. But it could be the wrong orthodoxy, especially if the world is going through a discontinuity, which it appears it is. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's a great opportunity for us in the context of being an actuary, as well as in the context of the BSMD strategy. So I, I don't know if Stephen's got anything to add to that or? Uh, no, we have, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about process, which is that, uh, as Sweet Chai said, uh, council, our council approved a recommendation from our climate risk uh, related task force. Uh, and, and the aim is uh, that through a range of measures, uh, the actuaries consider climate risk in the same way they would any other uh, typical actuarial risk. And that will be partly through uh, education. Uh, we'll be looking to uh, develop some increased skills, as said, through the uh, credential that Sweet Chai touched on earlier, uh, but actually making it a regular topic for discussion. And as Sweet Chai said, I think there has been a shift in the background music over the last, mood music over the last three or four years, but I think it is very difficult, regardless of your views as to where this might head, for it to be a topic that can, uh, that, 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 uh, it's a topic that needs to be discussed. Thank you. Um, I've got another uh, challenging question here, if I may say so. I think this is a question for you, Stephen. Um, okay. I'm sure a lot of members online uh, want to ask the same question. Um, which is, will IFOA reduce the uh, subscription fees for 2020 slash 2021 due to COVID-19 pandemic affecting both employees and employers? Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Wen. That's a, a really good question. Uh, and we do know that uh, it has been a tough time for our members uh, and employers. Um, I think uh, my long-term aspira long aspiration would be to see uh, fee levels for members drift down a little bit. Uh, but I also be honest to say uh, that's not going to be realistic for us to achieve uh, for next year or probably the year after. And uh, the reason for that, quite simply, is that we are having to make investments in the business to deliver some of the service promises uh, that I've touched on today. So uh, moving uh, exams uh, online has required us to invest in the platform uh, and some of the underlying capability there. Um, and uh, we are making quite material investments in our systems as well. So I'm hoping that when those are delivered, uh, that we will then be able to have a look at what is the, um, the, the right level of fee. Uh, but it does, I think, pull into a much wider piece about this sort of member proposition I touched on earlier. Uh, I think fees are an important element of it and what our members feel they get value for money for is really important, but it's not just about the money. As, as Sweet Chai said earlier, it's a bit about the reputation, it's a bit about the cachet of feeling involved with IFOA. 
uh, but it also is a little bit about how we show some leadership positions, how we demonstrate quality, how we just demonstrate professionalism, and how we demonstrate that we support our members throughout their careers. And I think that's very easy to say. What we've got to do is some really important work over the next 12 months of sort of pulling it together into a framework that feels integrated so that when we ask our members, members they're really clear on why they're a member of IFOA and what they value about it and I think we've got work to do there uh, when. Mm, agreed um, thank you very much for still sending in questions um, so I'm just going to pick one question at random on my screen which I think is very good uh, uh, either of you can answer uh, this is a very good question I think uh, great to hear about the move into for further qualifications in banking, data science, climate change. Uh, one question I have been asked by my actual colleagues in the developing markets is uh, the costs are quite high uh, to do those exams. And some universities are actually offering the similar courses. So where I have always consider cross recognition. Do you want me to pick that one up, Sweet Chai? Uh, cross what? Subsidization, is it? Cross, <laughs> cross recognition. I think the member is asking whether we would actually recognize university courses uh, because now the univer at universities, they're teaching data science, climate change, and banking as well. So instead of doing a professional exams, will we actually consider recogn recognizing more university courses? No, I think that we have a process for that. It must have correspondence with what we have in our thing because we don't want dilution. Uh, but we are very open to working with external institutions to, to, to make sure that they reach our uh, certification. Say, for instance, data science is not created by our actuary, it's created by Southentum, Southentum Academy. But we, but we do make sure that, that, um, that when we put our brand to it, uh, we're happy to put our brand to it. Yeah. So, so I, I think. Not, not because the university had a data science degree, therefore we give them some units. I don't think we are in that space for a, for a foreseeable future, not in a foreseeable future. Okay. Stephen, anything to add? Uh, just just a, a slight build, which is that the um, uh, uh, review of our curriculum does enable us to have more flexibility about working with others in the future. Uh, but as Rito says, I think there'll always be two criteria we'll want to consider. Uh, one is um, uh, standards. Uh, if our name is being attached to it, we'll want to be certain uh, of the standards that are attached. But in the work that we are doing, uh, we just want to also make sure that whether, well, regardless of the topic, that it's tailored for choice. You know, some, some of these other things are very generic and can make it difficult for our actuaries to apply them in the world that they're in. So the Southampton Data Science uh, Credential is a really good example of, yes, it is led by Southampton, but it is tailored for actuaries. And I think that's another dimension that we just want to make sure that we play out. Our work in banking has the same element as well. I think something which is standalone and unconnected with an actual community, I think you could understand would be a bit, a bit cautious about introducing into our curriculum. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we've coming to uh, to the end of today's session. Hey, can I please ask you to put the QR code on the screen so I can ask our members to scan and provide us some feedback. Thank you. So thank you very much for attending today. It's great to have you here, although I can't actually see you faces, but it's great to have you. And thank you very much for for attending and uh, if you can please provide some feedback to us and that will help us greatly uh, to the next uh, uh, sessions. Um, obviously I've had I've heard members telling me that they really want to go back to the face-to-face -face events. Unfortunately we've not been able to do that and I, I know you want to see each other, you want to see me, I also want to see you. So as soon as we can do that I will let you know it's coming to the year end. Please Stay safe and be well. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.